Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's kind of funny when you're putting these things together <clears throat> to uh, give your message. It sounds so different in your mind than what actually comes out. But I'll, I'll try to recreate whatever was on my mind when I was writing this. I want to share with you some things that uh, have been in my mind for the past few weeks. You know, the Lord has been dealing with me uh, regarding my situation with uh, my wife and where and what I am supposed to do now. You know, it has been a very difficult time for me because I allowed myself to be blinded by the devil and not see what the Lord was trying to tell me. So because of that, I became quiet. I kept to myself. I was sad. And uh, people were picking up on those things because people were approaching me and asking me, how you doing? Are you sure? Don't lie to me. Uh, yeah. But, you know, every time something like that happened, the Lord immediately put in my heart the same thing, spiritual warfare. And then he also gave me the same phrase over and over, I have decided. So during the course of those, those past few weeks, some things were started to be revealed to me until everything became clear about two weeks ago uh, when Mike looked at me and, and he said, you're leading worship next Sunday. So it all made sense because the Lord was preparing me to make a declaration of faith, uh, a declaration that I made last Sunday as I battled my own demons while leading worship right here on this platform. Uh, everything that happened up to that point had to do with what had been heavy in my spirit regarding something that I felt I needed to do. Uh, and it became much stronger after worship last Sunday. So I prayed about it. I asked the Lord for wisdom and guidance. Uh, I spoke with several people about this and see where the spirit was leading them after I showed them what had been in my heart and in my mind. And the reason why I did this is because uh, this particular decision is the complete opposite of what the Lord promised me about my relationship with my wife. Uh, so as I was thinking through that, the Lord reminded me of Abraham and that took me to Genesis 22. And it came to pass after, after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham said unto his, his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay, no, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So you see, God had promised Abraham a son. And then he asked him to give him up as an offering. So 
So it makes you wonder what was going on in Abraham's mind. <coughs> Maybe he was thinking, what is it with this guy? First he promised me a son, gives it to me, and now he wants me to give him up as an offering. But Abraham believed. And he believed and trusted God, regardless of what he was seeing in the natural. So this brings me to my next point. Abraham listened to God. Psalms 85 verse 8 says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Why is it important to listen to what God is saying? Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 gives us the answer to this question. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. This decision has not been easy for me. I have agonized over it, I have cried, and I have questioned why am I being led in this direction. But I decided that I will listen to what God is trying to tell me and what he's saying to me, and I will take this step of faith, knowing that in the end, as the Shunammite woman said in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 26, it is well. So now to close, I want to read these words from a song that I have been listening to lately. And it goes something like this. Far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see. And this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and wind still know his name. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well with me. That's all I have. for questions. No, I'm kidding. Anyone has any uh, prayer requests or testimony before anyone raises their hand? Sorry. Um, I would like prayer for my sister. She might be coming here this summer and uh, I'm declaring right now that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to her what he's been trying to tell her for a while and she was going to be blessed and the outpouring of, of the Spirit of God from this church is going to touch her and she's going to become a new person and also uh for my brother my brother today closes a chapter in his life and he's going to start his next one tomorrow morning when he gets on a truck and drives all the way from connecticut to texas where he's moving mm -hmm. so i pray that uh god will watch over him the entire way there's no harm that comes to him his wife and his children and he's going to make it safe there and when he gets there that's the place where he's supposed to be because the Lord is taking him there for him to become the man he's always wanted him to be. So. Okay, now, anyone want to share? Yes, Debbie. Yeah, Sally was there <coughs> reunited with uh, 
sons and daughters from the south and the east. Uh, watch over them. Just uh, let the personality <coughs> explain according to the Lord. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just watch over and give them a time of rest and relaxation and, and restoration. I see restoration in the midst of this. <clears throat> and also for uh, Jody and the Pino family and those related to them as uh, Evelyn, uh, they had a service for her yesterday down in Carlisle. It was, a, it was an awesome turnout. It was an awesome turnout. A lot of testimonies and a lot of good fellowship, and, and Abby left a, a legacy. Uh, she left a legacy of prayerful blessings and uh, comfort in this time for them. Yeah. Along with what Mike said, the Lord told me this morning, as I was thinking about um, Nathan and his family together, um, I don't know what anybody knows, but uh, for some of his children, it's the first time he's ever had them all together under one roof. And there are a couple of them that it's the first time they've ever met. Mm -hmm. and, and as I was thinking about it, how awesome that is for him, and what a blessing, God said, it's the first. Yes. He is the leader of our church. And not that it, things have to happen to your pastor first before we can be blessed with the same things. But uh, we have all talked about restoration and peace of our families. And God told me that this is just the beginning. His family is the first, and the, there is much more to come. Wow. And and I, and I hear this clearly as anything that you know this is it's awesome. Amen. And then I read something this week that I just found interesting. You know, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a river. You know, from our bellies flow rivers of living water, and it flows from the throne of God. But where does it flow to? It flows to the throne. So if you're in the in the river and allow the Holy Spirit to use you, no paddling, no fighting, no effort, you're naturally going to end up at the throne. By his grace, there is no work. There is no effort. You know, when you, uh, I think of myself. Um, it's a relationship of you 
spirit and truth and, and come to the Lord just in truth. You know, if, it's, if you're frustrated and you don't understand something, just come to the Lord. That's what I love about the Lord. You can go to him 24-7 and, and just talk to him and let him know your concerns of your heart and, and let him know what you'd like to do. And then, you know, just surrender your will to the Lord. And, you know, Lord, it's your will to be done in this situation. And then he can give you that peace about it. And, and he just said, I will take care of it. I will handle it. And I just want to just thank the Lord. Thank you for reuniting us in this place in your name, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. We thank you for restoration in our lives, Lord, for bringing together those that have been apart for far too long. We thank you, Father, for guiding our steps. Because when we allow ourselves to be guided by you, Lord, we end up where we are supposed to be. Father, we ask that you bring protection to those that are going to travel, healing to those that are in need of healing, Lord, that you manifest in their lives as you have manifested in our lives, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of giving your only son, Lord, to die for us, Lord, so that we could come to you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your grace, for your revelation. <laughs> Wait, who changed the slide? Uh, next Friday, April 10th, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. Uh, do you have anything you want to add? Friday. It's not, well, yeah, in two weeks. Don't pay attention to what I say. I think uh, uh, we tapped into something last time we was here, yeah. and I think we need to remain in there and pray over downstairs, pray over all the ministries. This sanctuary, the leadership, the, those that are being called from the north, the south, and the east, and the west. Um, I, I'm already excited. It's a, almost two weeks away. And <clears throat> you're going to be here, Brother Tim, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, fire on that guy. We just haven't seen it on Sundays, okay? <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, y'all, y'all invited. You're all a part of it. You're y'all a part of it. Um, we can't do it by ourselves. doing worship for the whole time and <clears throat> yes it's, it's a house of worship but we're mostly called to be a house of prayer mm -hmm. and that's what we're really 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 focused on so there's been a shift going on in Eastern Gate House of Prayer um, <clears throat> and I'm trying to be obedient to it um, but as the Lord leads um, he'll glorify himself and magnify himself and reveal himself All right, well, let's speak the word.
Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Hallelujah. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I received the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reviews the devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, John and Johnny, would you mind taking the offering, please? The success of a church, the success of a pastor, is when he's able to take some time to be with his family and the church still functions. The success of a worship leader is when he can take off some time and the worship team still functions. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't need no stinking vacation. I whatever it takes you know if, if I'd be doing this in the flesh if the Lord hadn't truly called me here I would have been burned out probably two and a half years ago but it's his strength it's his calling so all the burdens on him but his pastor takes the day off to be with his family in a time of restoration Suzanne's gonna preach today she's gonna bring forth the word and I know it's relative to this Palm Sunday You didn't tell me nothing. I don't know nothing, okay? But as I was walking through this room yesterday, after I was at uh, Jody's stepmother's uh, gathering down in Carlisle, I walked in this room, and, and down, even downstairs, I could, there was a piece of God in here. And this worship set, it just locked in yesterday, and it stayed right where it's at. It hasn't moved. Um, Tammy talked about the river of God. 
being in that river of God is to use correctly in this specific instance is being up the creek without a paddle. And, <laughs> and that's where I want to be. I don't want to control it. I don't want to control it. I just want his river to go. Have your way, Lord.
worship you, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Glory to your name, Lord. You King of kings and Lord of lords. You are worthy, Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Worthy are you, Lord. The Lamb that was slain. perfect love your perfect love your perfect love your perfect love Lord your perfect love Lord your perfect love your perfect love Lord we abide in your perfect love Lord for you alone are worthy, Lord. You alone are worthy. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Who can see? 
love is eternal, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. you have done it all, Lord. You have done it all, Lord. Just as you entered Jerusalem, Lord, humbly, Jesus, we enter your courts of grace tonight, this morning. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus. 
Thank you, worship team. I think I'm supposed to say that to dismiss you. <laughs> I'm a little rattled. Worship was amazing. <laughs> I'm not quite ready to be done. Whew. Hands are shaking, hearts pounding. God is good. Oh, I love to worship the Lord. I get so nervous when I sing a solo. <laughs> I don't know. I get so nervous. But you know how there's just some things you were meant to do. And there are certain songs that I was just born to sing. And that is one of those songs. And I'm, oh, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I don't know if Mike was sneaking a peek at my notes or just the way the Lord works, but it is Palm Sunday. And honestly, I, I, I didn't grow up in church like, you know, where they have all their, I don't know what Holy Week is, I don't know what all the Monday Lottie, I don't know what all that stuff is, but I do know what Palm Sunday is. And, you know, there are a lot of people that want to get into a discussion on whether we should celebrate these made up holidays or whatever. I don't care what we call it, I don't care when we do it. This is a memorial. This is a time to remember, to celebrate. So Palm Sunday is just simply us remembering when Jesus went into the pit of vipers, knowing what was before him. He entered the city of Jerusalem, knowing that the leaders, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, wanted nothing but to kill him. He knew what he was doing, but he came anyway. And thank God, like Don said, we get a picture. There were some people that got it. There were some people that knew who he was. And so today we commemorate the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. He came bringing a message to the religious leaders of that day, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the aristocrats, the powerful men. He told them flat out with no qualms, you're deaf and you're blind. You think you serve, the God you think you serve is right here before you, robed in human flesh, but you cannot see and you cannot hear. The entire ministry of Jesus Christ was to teach all of those who could hear, who would hear, that God wants relationship, not man-made religion. And by the time Jesus entered the picture, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were so blinded by their own self-righteousness, they no longer thought they needed a Savior. How else could they not know him and see him? They assumed they'd achieved the height of religious achievement their stature through their personal adherence to the mountains of laws that have been created since the days of Moses at Mount Sinai. And just because I've never really studied that, I wanted to kind of know what that was. Because in their own minds, they were experts on this law. In their own opinions, they knew and they followed all 613 of these commandments, the mitzvot, they call it. 613, and I was kind of joking with Mark and Roberto before I tried to print them all out, but it like virused and crashed my printer. I couldn't even print them all out. Like I, like pages, 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 a burden, a weight. And, and I think back to when Moses went to Mount Sinai and he said, bring everybody up. And they said, no, we're scared. That looks scary. There's thunder and lightning. That's scary. God is scary. You go, Moses, and you tell us. So Moses went. And God gave him 10, right? Not 613. God gave him 10. And they came back. And Moses came back. And they said, okay, yep, we'll do it. We got it. We're good. You, you tell us and we'll do it. Well, the problem with that is that then a situation would arise. Well, Moses, what do we do about this? Because they had to go to Moses for everything, right? They couldn't talk to God. They couldn't pray. They couldn't go to the Word. And those 10 didn't cover everything. So suddenly, the 10 becomes 613. 613. <laughs> like, that blows my mind. Sacrifices and offering, the law of the burnt offering, the law of the meat offering, the law of the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. Establishing the priesthood, establishing governance. There's tribes, there's leaders of the tribes, there's priests, there's, the, you know, the dietary law, eat this, don't eat that. Personal hygiene, purification after childbirth, laws about skin plagues, leprosy, how to deal with leprosy, law about uncleanness, wash, don't wash. Personal conduct, punishment for sin, the oil and sherbet, blessings for obedience, punishment for disobedience, vows and tithes. That's just a summary. I just flipped through Leviticus and wrote down the, the highlight. <laughs> There's so much. 
And, and like I think back and, I, and, and what God was saying is, okay, so you've been in Egypt, you've been in slavery, I'm going to give you some guidance here on what to do and what to do pr to protect you. Right, not to, to don't, lepers are bad. Don't, don't hang out with lepers, don't let them in your house, don't, you know, like things that kind of make sense, but how it became what it was in the time of Jesus blows my mind. Like I don't understand, like all of those years and all of the Old Testament, like, you know, here's the rules, right? Here's the rules, here's the rules, and here's the good news. Oh, that's the concordance, hang on, that's not, <laughs> that's the good news, right? The good news is simple. We don't need a thousand pages to understand the good news. And so what, rather than taking the time where I crashed my brain to talk about the law, <laughs> let's understand what it is and what it isn't and how subtle religion can be. That's what I want to talk about. Religion is the same thing as the law, is the same thing as Antichrist, is the same thing as bad. Okay, it's bad. So this, and so, and so in that context, I think of, but go back to Palm Sunday. So these religious leaders, right, they had worked hard all their lives. They'd studied, they'd gone with they'd, they'd a personal sacrifice to, you know, to not do this and don't do that, don't do this. And they had earned their position of power, right? They were wealthy, they were powerful. And then this man, Jesus, shows up, the son of a carpenter. And he is an instant superstar. Miracles, things that they can't comprehend and in their eyes, the ultimate blasphemer. Mm -hmm. What did he do? How is he? Who is he to? Blowing their minds. Can you just imagine how livid they must have been to watch this whole procession take place? Mm -hmm. He's coming in on a young donkey, not even a valuable, beautiful you know, parade, on a lowly young donkey, probably wobbling under his weight. I mean, it was a young, young donkey. And the people lining the streets, throwing their coats down, giving him honor, waving palm branches. And they're like, they don't even do that for us. And we're important. We're special. And they're crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It was they, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, that were in charge. They were the ones chosen to lead their people by God. God had appointed them, had chosen them, had hand-selected, and now this lowly peasant rides in the back of a donkey and steals the show. So the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were powerful, wealthy, successful in their own mind, but in God's eyes, they were blind, lost, and dead. Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 4. The message of Jesus Christ was lost on them. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. The message of Jesus Christ was lost on them. They didn't understand how you didn't have to earn it, how you didn't have to work for it, how it wasn't earned. So as Jesus entered Jerusalem, the Sadducees and Pharisees were done playing games with this Jesus of Nazareth. They were done trying to squash his ministry, they were done trying to silence his followers, and they were thirsty for blood. Religion wanted Jesus nailed to a cross, dead and silenced. But Jesus was just getting started. The thing that they thought would stop all their problems was the fulfillment of their own scriptures, was the fulfillment of the promise of new life, of eternal life, the gift of Jesus Christ. And he faced the religious leaders head on without trying, without over and over trying to show everyone around how shallow their interpretations of the scriptures were and how little they understood about the God that they served. So once Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was on. It was on. First thing he does, he goes to the temple. Sheila, Matthew 21, 12 through 13. Jesus started to preach and to teach like never before. And his disciples were like, Where's our benevolent savior? What is he doing? He goes to the temple. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have turned it into a den of thieves. The temple was the pinnacle, 
This was the place all Jewish believers would go. This was the ultimate, like, capital. This was the place, this was the center, the epitome of their faith. And he called it a den of thieves. I don't know how much more clear he could have been about what he thought about what was going on in Jerusalem. So where is this benevolent savior, right? Where's the peace? Well, Matthew, I'm sorry, um, Matthew 10, 34. Jesus didn't come for peace, right? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Well, what sword? Well, Hebrews 4.12 tells us about this sword, the sword of truth. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and to the jo- of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, came to cut to the chase, to cut this thing down at the root, the fig tree, right? He spoke to the fig tree, and it died from the roots up. This was the end, the beginning of the end of the old covenant. He was drawing a line in the sand, saying, out with the old, in with the new. Uh, Let's see. We cannot serve the law, our need, our desire to do right and wrong, and abide in Christ, to rest and trust in him, to trust in his finished work. And this one dilemma has plagued man since the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. We cannot mix the human heart's desire for knowledge and control with the free gift of grace. In other words, the old covenant cannot be mixed with the new covenant. Mark 2, 22. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but the new wine must be put into new bottles. When you mix, it all gets ruined. There's no power in the old, there's no power in the new, it's all a disaster, and it's garbage. Uh, Galatians 5, 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Well, geez, that's extreme. That seemed harsh. One little tiny bit. But when we choose to try to earn God's love, to earn his acceptance, to earn his favor, or to simply try and do it ourselves, we completely disqualify ourselves from receiving the free gift of grace. That seems so harsh. But we must understand that once you place yourself under one ounce of the law, you become accountable to all of the law. And that is a burden that we were never meant to carry. The law is a relentless taskmaster that makes you a slave. Paul addressed this over and over and over in the New Testament. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, 1, Sheila. And then I have it from the Message Bible too. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, over and over, we're told what the works of the flesh are. Fear, lust, anger. Mm -hmm. So when those things come, that's our old man, right, rising up. But we must not let those things ensnare us. Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Roberto, I have decided. I have decided I will take a stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. I am emphatic about this. The moment any one of you submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment, Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the ways of circumcision trades all the advantages of the free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. Is that a hard choice to make? But this is so cunning. This is what happens over and over and over again. God's grace, his unmerited favor, is all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Jesus Christ gave all so that we have nothing left to do. We have nothing left to do other than say thank you and tell somebody. Go tell somebody the good news. 
When we take up the yoke of bondage ourselves, we are telling God that the cross was not enough. We tell God, we tell Jesus Christ, thanks Jesus, but that wasn't quite enough for me. I can handle it. There's something I need to do to make it better, to make me better, because you couldn't do it for me. We diminish the power of the cross and the power of his resurrection. Jesus paid the highest price for our salvation. He endured the suffering and the anguish of the cross in order to offer us eternal life through his obedience and ultimate resurrection. A, a long time ago, um, I was praying for, for someone about a situation, and the Lord kind of showed me in my pictures like I get in my head um, that there was somebody, they were locked in a room, and their hands and feet were shackled. And I had this key, and on one side of the key it said obedience, and on the other side of the key it said joy. So I thought, well, when we obey, obedience is better than sacrifice, as for Samuel. If we obey, then we have joy. Well, no. <laughs> Years later, I finally got revelation. And I'm so excited to share with you what happened. So Christ's obedience, his perfect obedience, gives us access to joy. Our obedience can unlock our hands and our feet, and we can woo, praise the Lord in our little room. And so what I saw is when I understood it was the obedience of Christ, his perfect obedience has unlocked a world of nothing but joy. Yes. Nothing but joy. So like, okay, go with me, Beauty and the Beast, Snow White, Castles, Fairy Tale Land, Happily Ever After Land. I saw this little tiny spire, you know, those little tiny towers, like Rapunzel, a little tower, mm -hmm. and this like mile-long bridge, a skinny little walkway, and a kingdom, a whole kingdom that, I, woo, we're happy, we're, we're praising the Lord in our little... Nothing compared to the whole world that awaited when that joy unlocks the door to a world, a kingdom of God that we cannot even imagine. Beautiful, happily ever after, no more tears, no more sorrow. But we have to receive his obedience and stop trying to obey ourselves and receive that joy. And that is the strength. That is the hope. That is what keeps us going. Do we truly honestly, with all of our heart, accept the finished work of the cross? Or have we built an altar where we move in and we stay constantly repenting, asking forgiveness, confessing our sins, praying to change, to do better, to be better? Yeah. Religion tells you, go with the cross. Go, go, God will transform you. God will make you better. God will make you better. God has already finished it. You aren't getting any better. Yeah. It is done. Yeah. Religion wants to keep you at the cross, wants to keep you dead to keep resurrecting that old man to kill him, to resurrect him to kill him, to resurrect him to kill him. You have no cross to bear. That's right. Don't stay at the cross and think about how you're not good enough. Don't stay at the cross and reject the free gift of grace from Jesus Christ. Don't think that you're not worthy. You are a new creation. Religion says sit here and think about what you've done. Bad, bad girl, bad, bad boy. Sit here and think about what you've done. But Jesus says, you are righteous. You are holy. You are a new creation. You are perfect. Well, what about the scripture that says, take up your cross and follow me? Do we really think that Jesus was saying to go get nailed to a piece of wood and die? Do we really think that's what he was saying? Deny yourself, suffer, follow me? What did Paul say? Paul got it. Paul understood. So let's look at Galatians 2, 20 through 21. These are scriptures that we have heard over and over again. But I was struck by one word in Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. One word that stuck out, I am. I am crucified. That's not past tense. That's not I was crucified. That's not I'm going to be crucified. That's I am. That is a place of living with the old man nailed to the cross, so I'm free to move on in newness of life. Let's leave the old dead man on the cross and I am crucified, I got, and, and boy, he, he, won't, he won't die. I know. I carry him around. He talks. Ooh, he's got a loud voice. He talks. 
tries to tell me to do things, I say things, Ooh, mm, mm, I say things, I do things, he's dead. Yes. He's dead. God can't hear him. I hear him. I remember. He's dead. God doesn't hear him anymore. As if, he, as if he never existed. God looks at you as if your old man never even existed. Do we still need an altar? Do we still need another sacrifice? Do we need to go back and throw ourselves up in the cross? Or is it once for all? Let's agree that it's once for all. Religion tells you that when your old nature wins, you have to go back to the cross and start all over again. Start all over again, you're, you're worthless, you're backslidden. But that is not true. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Yes, Only the law requires death and punishment. And what did Jesus say? I came to fulfill. That's right. That's right. He didn't destroy it, he fulfilled it. Yes. It is finished. Yes. There is no law that, that you are accountable to, not one. Not one iota of 613 or whatever other made up ones there are, not one. Fulfilled. Exactly. Only the law demands death. Grace, Grace is life, yes. and peace, and love in the Holy Ghost. Come on. So, what, when Jesus fulfilled the law, he opened up a whole new world. In doing so, Jesus opened the way for us to be reconciled with God and that we will be one with him. Mm -hmm. In John uh, chapter 17, verse 21. Jesus is praying before he endures death, the death of the cross. And what is his prayer? Oh, Father, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Oh, when there are moments when we know that we know that we know we are one with God. Those moments are precious, and unfortunately they're few. Because this world around us, the old nature within us, does everything. That enemy, pick, 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 whisper, whisper, whisper. Constantly. The world. We are in this fallen world. Constantly. But we are one. And that's our choice. That's our goal. That's where we take a stand. And we say, I will not go back. I am moving ahead. Amen. And by making us one with him, we become the first among many brethren, ushering in a whole new species of mankind. A new age of man on earth. Luke 24, 49. 24:49. Promise of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Acts 13, 52. Yeah, <laughs> bring it. <laughs> Acts 13.52. Yep, Acts 13.52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, fill us with joy and fill us with the Holy Ghost. And another translation says we're continuously filled, continuously filled, continuously filled. When we have a need, God is there within us to pour out whatever it is we have need of. Right. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 to 24. And if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus... That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We have heard so many definitions of holiness, of righteousness, of what you have to do to achieve it, to earn it, to act like it, to look like it. God, Jesus Christ, is holy. When we are in him, Nathan said it over and over. All God looks down, all he sees is Jesus. You know, I told the, I, I use an analogy of the white coat, right? Jesus gave us this beautiful, sparkling white coat. I can't get it dirty. I can't get it dirty. I can play in the mud. I can roll around in the mud. This, this magic coat doesn't get, ever get dirty. 
it's his coat. He gave it to me, and he won't take it back. When he looks down, all he sees is this beautiful, radiant Amen. white coat. Amen. Nothing I can do, nothing I can say will ever tarnish it because it's a magic coat. <laughs> Kids get it. <laughs> But it is, right? We can't, we can't get it dirty. Like, oh, we know about getting clothes dirty, right? Especially kids, but magic coat. We can't ever tarnish it. We can't, ever, we can't give it back. He says once, we're forever. I'm with you forever. And not only are we then, whew, tongue twister. And then once we're one with him, then we can be one with each other. And that's the ultimate goal of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We are made one. Ephesians 4, chapter, um, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Ephesians 4, 13 through 16. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All of that to say we need every single one of you. Every single person that has ever called in the name of Jesus Christ is essential to revealing the fullness of who Jesus Christ is. Every one of you is a facet. A, a, a color in a, in a tapestry, one, one thread in this beautiful picture that he wants to reveal of himself, of who he is. So I have good news and I have bad news. Bad news, it's not about you. The good news, it's not about you. It's not about us anymore. The pressure is off. The pressure is off. All we do is trust and believe. If we, if we take a step in faith, just like Roberto talked about, take a step of faith and trust. That's all God asks of us. Trust him. Amen. Trust him that he will work it out. Yes. You are in creation, pure, holy, righteous. That is what grace is, and that is what grace does. Amen. We must all remember that I am crucified with Christ, but nevertheless, it's not I, but Christ who liveth in me. Yes. That life is the source of the power, that resurrection. We must remember that Jesus did not stay on the cross. His bones aren't in a tomb in Jerusalem. He rose again. And by the power of our Father in heaven, Jesus Christ rose from the grave, transformed by resurrection power. Yes. Transformed. Just like you were transformed the minute you said yes to Jesus Christ. Amen. That same resurrection power that gave all of us new life when we said yes to Jesus Christ. Now, for everybody has a different story. Everybody has a different testimony. Like, like Mike said last week, well, I must have been dumb because God had to speak in really big, bold pictures to me sometimes. But I had one of those moments where God let me know I was a new creation. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything except that there was this God and he was love. It is my wish that everybody would have the same experience. I asked Arlene about a church. She started telling me about Jesus Christ. She says, you don't need a church, you need Jesus. Right. And the Holy Spirit moved on me. I started bawling. I'm at work. <laughs> I started bawling. I'm like, oh, I don't know I'm going crazy. I'm losing my mind. She's like, no, that's, that's Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit. He's loving on you. Go, go to the bathroom and talk to him. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I go run into the bathroom. I got, and I wanted so much of this, this unbelievable warm blanket of love and acceptance. Yes. Oh, that it was all going to be okay, that I was perfect. Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't. I'm like, oh, but I'm, oh, wow, I am not perfect. Are you, the, and, and I, 
I remember having this like wrestling in my heart, like, I want this so bad, but I just can't. I'm not worthy. I can't. Who, who am I to, who, who's going to love me like this? It was almost too much. Yeah. And I finally remember just saying, you know what, Lord, whatever it is, I want it. I, yes. Whatever this is, yes. Hallelujah. And not very long later, Mother's Day is my rebirth day. It's the day I was baptized. It was Mother's Day Sunday. I didn't know what speaking in tongues was. I didn't know what anything was. I just knew they said to be baptized. I said, okay, dunk me. Let's get wet. So I show up, and this pastor, I've only met him like once or twice, and there's like 30 women speaking in tongues all around me. It was like, 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 like the atmosphere was just charged. You guys have been in those services, just charged. And he looks at me, and he starts speaking the words, and I start bawling. The pastor starts bawling. He dunks me. He looks, and he throws my hands in the air when I come up. And I think I was supposed to speak in tongues, but I didn't know I was supposed to try and talk out loud. But I just, I just lightning, like lightning from my fingertips down through my body to the tips of my toes and back out. And I was a new creation. I was different. There was no doubt. I didn't know anything. I knew two scriptures. I didn't know anything. But God let me know, you are not the same. You are mine. You are mine. And whether you felt that, whether you saw that, that was your exact same experience. God sent his spirit through you, and he gave you new DNA. You are alive forever. Yes. And whether, like I said, whether you had that same experience or not, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't walk. They had, like, lift me out, and I couldn't put my clothes on. It took me an hour to get dressed. I was, like, jello. I was like, whoo, God's good. <laughs> whoo, God's good. <laughs> and, you know, guys, I'm telling you, I've been all over. I was hungry, right? So I went to every revival. Oh, it's crazy. I know when I first met Nathan, he thought I was crazy. I was so hungry. I was, oh, let's read this book. Let's go to that preacher. Let's go. And it is nothing like what we have here. I've been all over this nation looking and hungering after the presence of God. And I come here and am filled so much more than anywhere I've ever been. And that just goes to show when God wants you somewhere, he will meet you. And he sees the hunger in your heart. And he will feed that hunger. And I totally got off track. But anyway, God is good. You are a new creation, transformed, unrecognizable. The old man doesn't like you. The old man doesn't want it. It doesn't want you to convince you that you're not this new creation. This old man says, no, come back and be over here. Let's go hang out the cross. Let's go be dead. Let's go. Oh, you're not worthy. You're, you know, you're, whoa, well, I don't know what you think you are, but you are not. You are not good enough. You are not this. You're not that. Oh, it's no longer I who live. Sorry, old man. No longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me, and he is alive. He is alive forevermore. And when we believe, and we have received the grace of God by faith, in love, we too are transformed. We are new creations, and only when we truly receive the finished work of the cross, only then can we begin to mature in our faith. We don't grow up. We don't, we don't grow up like our, our physical bodies do. We mature. We ripen. We hang out in the presence of the sun. We abide in the vine, soak up the sun, and we mature and we get sweeter. Life gets sweeter, and we get bigger, and our faith grows. Our belief grows. Those things that come. And, you know, I was thinking about this. So, you know, I've done like every network marketing company there is, and there's all these stories about these super powerful super fruits, right, these super fruits. And they always grow in the harshest conditions. Like, you know, the Amazon, these acai berries, they're, they're, it's a horrible environment. You know, it's like 95,000 degrees and it's 100% humidity. But they're like this really condensed superfruit. They have the most antioxidants of any fruit in the world. But then there's these Norwegian snowberries, and they grow in the snow, and it's like freezing all the time. But these super powerful fruits, and they hold these healing powers for the body. And isn't that just like us? The harsher the conditions, the sweeter and the more potent the fruit becomes. Come on. We have to just abide in the vine. The vine, those, those, those plants are so rooted. Their roots go so deep. Nothing can kill those suckers. Nothing can kill those. You can't, you can't, you can barely, you can cut them down, they just grow right back. Right. Nothing can shake us. We simply abide in the vine, hang on, and just enjoy the sun yeah. and get ripe. Yes. Get ripe for Jesus. <laughs> I don't know if that's really my message, but. He's done it all. Do we really understand? He has done it all. I don't know how many different ways we can say it, how many different ways we can talk about it. When we have it settled in our hearts that Jesus Christ has finished it, then we have something to share. 
then we have something to tell somebody that they might actually want to hear. I don't know anybody that wants 613 rules. And I know a lot of people that think that's what church is all about. Well, let me get, let, let me get right with God, and then I'll come back to church. Let me stop drinking. Let me stop doing drugs. Let me stop smoking. Let me stop doing this. I'll stop doing this, this, and I'll clean myself all up, and then I'll come back to God. Oh, no. Let's give this world something real. The ultimate goal of the ministry of Jesus Christ and the grace of God is to make us equal with him. Mm -hmm. Thinking it not robbery to be equal with God. And once we realize that we are no different than Jesus Christ, we have this grace-based relationship that makes us possible to truly be reconciled to God and to truly be reconciled with one another. And John understood this when he wrote 1 John chapter 4, and I'm actually going to read it out of the Message Bible. My dear friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying preachers loose in the world. Here's how you test for the genuine spirit of God. Everyone who confesses openly his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came as an actual flesh and blood person, comes from God and belongs to God, the finished work. Right? And everyone who refuses to confess faith in Jesus has nothing in common with God. This is the spirit of Antichrist that you heard was coming. Well, here it is, sooner than we thought. My dear children, you come from God and you belong to God. You have already won a big victory over those false teachers, for the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. These people belong to the Christ-denying world. They talk the world's language and the world eats it up. But we come from God and belong to God. Anyone who knows God understands us and listens. The person who has nothing to do with God will, of course, not listen to us. This is another test for telling the spirit of truth from the spirit of deception. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we, want, not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage we've already done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like that, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God ever, but if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes part of us, perfect love. This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He's giving us life from this life, from his very own spirit. Also, we've seen for ourselves and continue to state openly that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's Son participates continuously in an intimate relationship with God. We know it so well, we've embraced it in heart and soul, that love, this love that comes from God. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes a home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical to Christ's. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is not one yet fully formed in love. We, though, are going to love, to love and to be loved. First we were loved, and so now we love. He loved us first. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he's a liar. If he won't live, if he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Love God, loving God includes loving people. We've got to love both. You know, and um, I think of, uh, let's see, oh, I, I wrote a couple other things. People are not always easy to love, and people don't always want God's love. 
But what else do we have to offer them? What else do people really honestly need? What is it that gets so twisted in people's lives that they hurt and they lash out? They need love. They need God's love. Only God can heal those places. And in the Message Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, one we're all very familiar with. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that, com- that, that consummation. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. And the best of these three is love. So every moment of every day, we have a choice to make. Religion or relationship. Repentance or resurrection, work or worship? Do we sit at the cross and think about how unworthy and how imperfect we are? Do we reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ altogether and take matters into our own hands? Or do we simply embrace the living Christ that abides in our heart and trust that he will work it all out? As Roberto said earlier, I have decided. I have decided. I choose Christ. In Jesus' name. Everyone be blessed. Have a wonderful week, and you are dismissed in Jesus' name.